The AGM-114 Hellfire is an American air-to-ground missile, perhaps most prolifically seen carried by Apache helicopters and Predator and Reaper unmanned aerial vehicles. Although historically developed as a successor to the tow anti-tank missile, the Hellfire's role has expanded greatly. Being used in precision strikes against high-value targets and even on rare occasions, as an air-to-air -air missile. And while the Hellfire has traditionally been used as an air-launched missile, during the 80s and 90s, there were efforts to mount the Hellfire system onto a ground vehicle for use with the U.S. Army. Today, we examine one such vehicle. Welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host, Mochi, and today, I'll be covering the M901 GLH-H, a prototype designed to carry the Hellfire missile onto the battlefield rather than above it. If you like what we do and want to see more of it, don't forget to like the video, and if you haven't already, subscribe, so you don't miss a single upload. Development of the Hellfire missile can be traced back to the late 1960s with the laser semi-active missile and missile system target illuminator controlled programs. By 1969, the program for the system was known as the Heliborn Laser Fire and Forget Missile, later shortened to Heliborn Launched Fire and Forget Missile, before being drastically shortened a final time to simply Hellfire. The Hellfire was being offered for procurement by 1973 and was picked up by the U.S. military in 78, with the first test firings that same year. Army trials were completed in 81, with full-scale production beginning the following year. By the end of 1984, the Hellfire was in service with the U.S. Army units stationed in Europe. The first missiles saw action during Operation Just Cause, the U.S. invasion of Panama in 1989. Seven missiles were fired with a 100% hit rate. The initial idea for a ground-launched variant originated in 1987 as a support unit for the 9th Infantry Division. At that time, the 9th ID was serving as the high-technology testbed for the U.S. Army. In theory, this meant they were to be a light air-deployable formation with firepower greater than that of a normal infantry division. In practice, it meant riding around in souped-up dune buggies with 50 cals attached while playing with M551 Sheridan light tanks because the armored gun system had yet to yield any results. And as history would show, never would. The initial vehicle chosen was the ubiquitous Hum V. Development and test firings were successful, presumably in part because the system comprised of a single missile launcher with two Hellfires bolted to the Humvee. There wasn't much to go wrong on a rather simple design. Nevertheless, by the time trials were completed in 1991, the military situation looked very different. 9th ID had reconverted to a regular division in 1989 and was actually undergoing inactivation by 91. With the Cold War coming to an end, there was no longer a demand for advanced weapon systems as the threat of an all-out brawl between East and West diminished. Concurrent with the Hellfire Humvee was another design, one slightly more protected. This was the ground-launched Hellfire Heavy or GLH-H variant. Such a vehicle would operate as a fire support team, or FIST, and could either engage targets indirectly by lazing them for other units, or directly engage with Hellfire missiles. The obvious choices for such a vehicle were the M2 Bradley, the LAV, or the M113. While the system was certainly tested on an M113, it is unclear if the Bradley or LAV were ever trialed as well. Although technically an M113 hull, the vehicle actually used for testing was an M901 improved tow vehicle 
or ITV. Unlike the iconic battle taxi, the ITV, as its name suggests, mounted a dual M220 tow missile launcher on its roof, as well as reloads within the vehicle. For the GLH-H program, the tow launcher was removed and replaced with a Hellfire turret. The hull remained unchanged, much like most M113 variants, the hull was simply a mechanism to move the weapon system to the optimum location. The turret itself consisted of four primary components. The Hellfire missile pods, a guidance system, the manned section of the turret, and the turret basket within the vehicle. The turret is approximately 8 mm thick and constructed with aluminum. Two hatches, presumably for a commander and a gunner, are located on the turret roof. The hatch on the left-hand side was presumably intended for the gunner and features four periscopes for observation. The commander's hatch on the right features another two, yet one of these has been removed or welded over. Of the remaining five, three are blocked by other components of the vehicle, and none of them actually face forward, instead covering the rear arc of the vehicle. At the front of the turret, offset to the left, sits the guidance module. U.S. military historian R.P. Honeycutt states that both the Army's Ground Locator Designator, or GLLD, and Marine Corps Modular Universal Laser Equipment, or MULE, were fitted to the vehicle. A metal strip on the rotating component would foul any attempt to elevate the laser designator higher than perhaps 30 degrees. This would make it difficult for the vehicle to engage aerial targets such as helicopters. Although as a testbed, some modifications would likely have been made to allow the vehicle to engage a broad spectrum of ground and aerial targets. On each side of the turret sits a pod containing the Hellfire missiles. Each pod is divided into four sections each holding a single Hellfire, meaning a total of eight Hellfire missiles could be carried ready to fire. It is likely that additional numbers of missiles would have been carried within the vehicle. Although these sections have hinges, suggesting they could be opened for the purpose of reloading the pods, they are held in place by bolts which prevents such openings. It appears the only way to reload these missiles would have been by rotating the turret slightly and having crew members load the missiles from the roof. The pods are too high for the crews to reload from the ground. A cover could also be attached to the front and rear of the pods, presumably to protect the missiles from any environmental damage. These covers could then be removed for firing. The pods are rotatable on the horizontal axis and could be rotated independent of one another. Although photographic evidence shows the pods at an angle less than 45 degrees, a maximum elevation is not known. The turret basket was the final component of the turret. The turret descends into the hull via a riveted cylindrical aluminum basket. Positions for two crew members are provided within the turret. The driver still sat in the front of the vehicle in his standard position, and a fourth crew member presumably the loader, would be sat in the rear with any spare hellfires. There was no access between the front and the rear of the vehicle due to the turret basket, unless both gunner and commander were not in the turret. The GLH-H appears to have been a somewhat orphaned program, while the GLH-L had the support of the Army and the Hellfire Project Office. In 1991, the HPO had been redesignated as the Air to Ground Missile Systems Project Office, leaving no doubt that interest in a ground launched Hellfire system had waned and faded. The time lag of nearly a decade between the original desire and testing had also proved fatal. For ten more years, the TOW had continued to be employed and was by the early 90s a proven weapon system. The Gulf War had also established that existing anti-tank systems and doctrine worked, thereby bringing into question 
the need for another anti-tank missile carrier. The GLH-H would also have encountered competition from the Bradley, which already carried two tow missiles and could fulfill a number of other mission profiles. The M901 was also being taken out of service, further raising questions about utilizing the M113 chassis for another frontline combatant. With no clear objective, and with the project office turning to airborne utilization of the Hellfire missile, the GLH-H was doomed to failure. The sole prototype was moved to the Historic Museum of Military Vehicles in Lexington, Nebraska, where it resides today. Although the concept of a ground-launched Hellfire system was eschewed in the 90s, in recent years, interest has again picked up in this department, both to allow the U.S. Army to strike targets at greater range and to replace the now 50-year-old tow missile. In 2010, Boeing tested the ability of the Avenger air defense system to launch Hellfire missiles. This would allow Hellfires to be fired not only from Humvees, but also LAVs and other systems. Hellfires have also been test-fired on Pandur 6x6 APCs, the family of medium tactical vehicle trucks, and Lockheed Martin's long-range surveillance and attack vehicle. Although by 2016, it appeared as though the Hellfire would be replaced by the AGM-179 Joint Air-to-Ground Missile. Now in 2022, the Hellfire remains in U.S. inventories with orders for more Hellfires still ongoing. By 2020, the dream of a ground-mounted Hellfire system was partially realized with the Interim Maneuver Short-Range Air Defense, or the IM Shorad. This is a Striker AFV equipped with a 30mm chain gun, a pod of Stinger missiles, as well as a pair of Hellfire missiles. Although both Stinger and Hellfire sections may be replaced, allowing for additional Hellfires or Stingers to be equipped as mission profile dictates. This concludes our look at the M901 ground-launched Hellfire Heavy prototype. If you aren't already, consider becoming a subscriber so you don't miss a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. The money comes back to you in the form of bigger and better videos. Until next time, keep us in your sights.